Most of the time when behavioral psychologists teach a rat to be afraid, and that's what they think they're doing, they take a rat that's secure. So they presume that the natural state of the rat is secure. But the only bloody reason the rat's secure is because it's already explored its cage. So you put a rat in a cage and it'll freeze because it's scared. And then if nothing terrible happens to it, it unfreezes and then it slowly starts to explore and it might just move its eyes first and sniff. And then if nothing terrible happens, it starts to move and soon it checks out the whole cage. And if nothing is in there that it's, that's going to kill it, it has a nap or whatever. Maybe it looks for some food, but it has to explore before it's secure. Now, more modern animal psychologists, ethologists, are starting to study the reactions of things like rats in their natural habitat. And that's what this story is about. So you take a rat, and rats, they're social, set them up in a burrow, and they let them set up their burrow, and they map out their territory by exploring. So they have this whole burrow system set up, and the rats know it. Nothing's dangerous there. That's home. Put a cat in one section of it. Okay, that's this story. When a cat is presented to an established mixed-sex group of laboratory rats living in the visible burrow, the behaviors of the subjects change dramatically. In many cases, for 24 hours or more, the initial active defensive behavior, flight to the tunnel chamber system. So the rats are cruising along where they think it's safe, and there's a cat. So it's like home into the burrow. It's followed by a period of immobility during which the rats make 22 kilohertz ultrasonic vocalization which apparently serve as alarm cries at a high rate. So they're, to put it, uh, they're freaked out fundamentally. They run home and scream. They're frozen. And they scream. Like, <laughs> they must be screaming something like, oh no, there's a cat. And all the other rats <laughs> hear this. And they're all in their burrows. They're terrified. They're frozen into immobility by the appearance of this unexpected thing. As freezing breaks up, it's interesting. Think of a good myth as Perseus and the Gorgon show the face of the Gorgon. It's this female head that's covered with snakes. That's an image of the unknown. That thing turns you to stone. Anyways, as freezing breaks up, proxemic avoidance of the open area gradually gives way to a pattern of risk assessment of the area where the cat was encountered. Okay, so the rats are frozen, and they think, you know, oh no, death is around the corner. They don't precisely think that, but that's how they act. And if nothing happens that's also terrible, well, they start to relax a little bit. And as soon as they start to relax, the circuitry, like they're very curious about this unexpected occurrence, but they're overwhelmed by anxiety. They don't do any exploring. They run back and make sure that nothing terrible happens, just like that wolf did with the sheepdog. They run back, and as their anxiety recedes, their curiosity starts to predominate. So they go back to the open area. Subjects poke their heads out of the tunnel openings to scan the open area where the cat was presented for minutes or hours before emerging. So they're like watching. This is new territory now. There is not supposed to be a cat there, so let's just see what happens. So they're watching and watching and remapping the territory. When they do emerge, their locomotory patterns are characterized while well, they kind of run flat, so they can't be seen. But the thing that's really neat is they do short corner runs. I think this is so interesting. So you think, here's the area that the cat was seen, okay? So it's like, cat. <laughs> right? Now the rats saw the cat there, so this is, this is all of a sudden being re-novelized, this area. It was once mapped and made secure, but the appearance of the cat there has thrown their plans for a loop. So what do the rats do? Well, the cats disappeared, but they don't trust this area anymore because it was associated with the cat. So they do corner runs. The bravest of rats leaps out of his tunnel and runs right across a small area. And if, if he doesn't get killed, safe. So then he runs back, takes another chunk out of it. Safe. Now the rats are doing the same thing. Soon, if there's no cat, the whole area is mapped again. These risk assessment areas appear to involve active gathering of information about possible danger sources, providing a basis for a gradual return to non-defensive behaviors. Active risk assessment is not seen during early post-cat exposure, but rises to a peak about 10 hours later. These rats are scared. Non-defensive behaviors such as eating, drinking, and sexual aggressive activity tend to be reduced over the same period. Well, that's because the anxiety system just predominates. It's like you don't think about anything else when there's a cat around. So it's such a, such a great story because you get an idea of how the rat's universe is set up. It's like there's known territory, and then there's unknown territory. And when known, and known territory can turn into unknown territory as soon as something unpredictable happens. And when something unpredictable happens, that whole area is, is made novel again, and the rats have to undergo this very complex pattern of exploratory activity to make their territory secure again.
So that's, that's quite interesting. Now it's also the case, now I, I gave you here a representation of novelty. That's what novelty does to people. It's half threat, which may, produces anxiety. It's half promise. It impels exploratory activity. Anxiety comes up first. This has been known among behavioral psychologists for about five decades. It's like, um, the exploratory and the anxiety circuitry are mutually inhibitory, but the anxiety circuitry has the upper edge in terms of potency and rapidity of rise in fundamental. So, uh, okay. So, let me show you something. Oh, it's also the case. So, rats, they identify each other by smell. And if, if you smell like you should smell, then you're familiar. You're not contaminated with the unknown. So your behavior is predictable, which basically means that I know your place in the dominance hierarchy. I know what role you play with all the other animals. And I know how to behave in your presence. You're familiar. You're kin. And I can tell that if I'm a rat by the way that you smell. OK, so you take a rat that everyone loves, and you pull it out of its cage, and you wash it off. And you throw it back in with the rats, they kill it. Because that rat is now contaminated with the unknown. And we don't like to have the unknown around because it upsets our predictability. And when our predictability gets upset, then our anxiety levels rise and, and all hell breaks loose. And literally all hell breaks loose because actually hell is a mythological representation of the unknown. At least that's it in part. Now, from the mythological perspective, the world has three constituent elements. The unknown, which is everywhere. The known and the process by which one is turned into the other, which is basically exploration. So the knower is the archetypical, archetypal pattern of exploration, the thing that mediates between the unknown and the known. And from the mythological perspective, part of the process that creates the world. 